Welcome to A Little Bit Radical, a business podcast from Standing on Giants. I'm Rob, your host. Join me as I meet people and organisations who are doing things differently, challenging the status quo and yes, might just be a little bit radical. How often have you got to the end of the month and wished you could be paid just a few days earlier? Maybe even a week, in my case. It's relevant today because I'm joined by Eric Porter, who is the Chief Risk Officer at WageStream. WageStream gives your employees control over when and how they get paid, giving them access to pay as they earn it. Not only that, WageStream includes a number of financial well-being tools, including spending and saving tracking, as well as access to personal financial coaching, making it a great solution to promote financial health. Eric himself has had a very illustrious career in finance with a real focus on promoting financial well-being. Eric, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Rob. It's great to be here. So we're going to start with a little bit radical you. So if you are a little bit radical and you're on our podcast, so we know you are, what do you think in your early life set you up for that? I think what really kind of triggered the, the radical side of me was being in a well, what is now not a small town, but a, a smallish part of the Midwest of the U.S., and really wanting more and, and wanting to to see a wider world, and being really bored one day actually in a German class in I think it was the tenth grade, I got an application to become an exchange student as part of a program that was then sponsored by the U.S. Congress and the and the German Bundestag or their Parliament. And I thought, oh, okay, I'm not doing anything. I'll just fill out this application, long shot, not going to get it, you know, something to do. And fast forward three months, I was in an interview, two weeks later, postcard in the mail, you're going to go be an exchange student in Germany for a year, one of 300 people in the US selected, enjoy your time. And for me, I was like, wow, okay, didn't expect that to happen. Um, And at the same time, I was also very interested in politics and wanted to study law. And I thought, oh, this will be a really great way to get into that because it was all kind of political based and I had already learned a bit of German. So I thought, well, this will be good. I'll be able to use and and refine those skills. And then I found myself as a 15 year old in a very small town in former East Germany. This was 1995. So, you know, only a few years after the wall had come down and things had really changed radically for them, living with a family who knew as little about the Western world and and the U.S. as probably I did about what was Eastern Germany. And so, yeah, that kind of sparked the interest. And it was from there that I realized there is this world outside of my world and a whole bunch of different types of people, cultures, and all the things that that come with that. And really watching them experience life as a free people, having left the kind of communist regime that existed then, and watching them go through those experiences of what that meant and, you know, opening things like their secret police files and really understanding that, you know, people that were in their day-to-day lives had been spying on them and, and how that affected them emotionally and how, you know, there's no handbook for I now have to get my own insurance wasn't a problem in the East German state. I have to worry about a job or and all those things. Again, things that weren't problems. There's no handbook for these things in life. And that really made me realize as, you know, a young person then, but even then later in life, actually we're missing a lot of handbooks. There's, you know, we we go through education systems, some of us for years and years and years, and there's still a whole lot of stuff we don't know when we come out of, of an education system or that life doesn't teach us either because of exposure or our parents being good or bad with money, as an example, or whatever those experiences are shaped by. And yeah, that really just caused me to think differently about what I might want to do with my life. Thank you for that answer, Eric. That's so interesting. That really must have been quite a culture shock. Have you got a kind of a top memory of of your time with that family in in East Germany, you know, former Soviet East Germany, that really was the the most clear example of culture shock for you at the time? Yeah, actually, my top memory, and it's a really funny one now, was I needed to call my parents every couple of weeks or every month, right? Just to check in and what was happening back in Kansas City. And I didn't really ever think about it. I surely thought this family will have a phone and once a month I'll call and that'll be it. And the kind of three, four weeks elapsed and I thought, well, maybe I should call home. And I asked, you know, can I use the phone? And they just kind of looked at me and they said, well, but there is no phone. 
And I said, well, what do you mean there's no phone? They said, well, we've been on the waiting list for a phone for 12 years or 13 years or whatever it was, which was very common again in the East German state, whether you were waiting for a TV, a telephone, a bookcase, whatever it was, because they were producing lots of stuff, but then it was sent off to Russia to be used and sold by the Russians. They didn't have a phone. They said, oh, but we have, you know, the, the father and the family was employed and said, oh, we can go to my office. It's down the street. So we'd get in the car or walk to the office once a month and I would call home for about an hour while he sat there and kind of, you know, did whatever he was doing. This was before, you know, now he'd be sitting there on his phone playing solitaire or something. But, you know, this was before all of that. And that was just completely foreign to me in terms of a you don't have a phone in your house but b you've been on a waiting list to get a phone you know something even i in 1995 when this was happening would have never fathomed i don't think anybody can fathom it today but yeah and, and really thinking wow these people have really had to struggle for literally anything that they wanted and constantly asking for permission rather than just being the consumers that we all are today and walking out and getting it Absolutely. What a brilliant example. When you came back to Kansas City, did you have some interesting conversations with the people there? And did you feel that you had changed somewhat and that you saw things very differently from your family, your peers? Yeah, yes, is the answer. And I need to answer that in two parts. I tried to have different conversations, but you realize very quickly that you now are experiencing reverse culture shock. And they looked at me as if I had three heads. I would describe things to them, similar to what I just described to you, and they would look at me and they would say, what? What are you on about? And I remember, you know, telling the stories and talking to people. And it wasn't about two months into what was in my senior year of high school. So I, I was gone during my junior year, 11th grade. So 12th grade, I came back. I'm now a, a senior, almost ready to graduate. The German school system was so good, in my opinion, um, in terms of the number of subjects and amount of learning you do in a year versus the then U.S. school system, that I had basically all of the credits I needed to graduate. So I didn't have a heck of a lot to do that year. I spent a lot of time being like a teacher's assistant and singing in the choir and doing, you know, stuff that you know wasn't really about learning. And so here I was sat already feeling different because I'd been away. Now I'm different because I'm not in all the normal classes that the rest of my peer group are in. And I'm trying to share with them experiences that they have no clue what to do with. And then someone from the school newspaper turns up and says, oh, we should do a, a story on you. And so I was the center page of, of the school newspaper one month. I still have that newspaper lying around here somewhere. And it's just a really funny story. And even as they wrote about me, you know, the, the, I, you can tell in the article they had no idea what to do with me, right? So some poor journalism student had been given the task of go try and figure out what the heck Eric's on about. And yeah, maybe they did it, maybe they didn't. But uh, yeah, that was difficult. And so I then knew and felt like I think I've outgrown this place and I want more, but I'm still 18 and more is going to have to wait because I'm supposed to do university and all the stuff that 18 year olds need to be able to do. I then got a part time job that was working for Citibank, which is a brand that many people will recognize, you know, very, you know, call center job, evenings and weekends. I just thought it was a job. Didn't really think about it. It wasn't working in food service or retail, which sounded great to me. So I was happy to take it. And then I found that actually now I was in a place where there was a bit more international exposure. It was a you know, large organization back then present in 100 countries, even though we were still slightly insulated in the U.S., starting to have exposure to people that had worked in other countries, that moved around, that traveled. And I thought, oh, OK, so now this is maybe the ticket. This is how we get out of Kansas City. It's been a bit of a theme on this podcast, actually, when I speak to our guests that in their early life, they've been exposed to some experience that their peers probably haven't been exposed to. And that's opened the door to a different way of doing things, different perspectives, you know, and has left them. It's interesting you using the word wanting more. Can you tell us more about what that meant to you then? Wanting more back then meant it was more about exposure and experience and culture. It's like, okay, I've been in a predominantly white society, predominantly middle class society. Everybody looks like me. They behave like me. Their parents do the same similar jobs. Just something 
different, right? It just something where everybody didn't look the same or sound the same. I also kind of had this thing pushing and saying, oh, you've spent all this time learning a language. You're going to lose it if you sit around here. So you need to keep up that skill. And also thinking about how fortunate I was and the people that were around me. You know, we, we, we were in a pretty well-developed society. You can argue that today, but what we thought was a good thing and we didn't want for much. And we you know, kind of were just going through the motions, if you will, you know, as a university student following that kind of standard path. And that's where I really started to think about building and transforming and doing and thinking, actually, there's this world out there. You know, my exposure to the outside world back then was the woman standing in Africa on TV with the flies all around her telling us we needed to feed the children, right? So that it was two extremes. It was these starving children in Africa or what was happening in the U.S., there was no in-between. And the experience in Germany really helped me to actually see, well, there, there's a group of people out here who are not the starving children in Africa of the 1980s and 90s, but that actually also need quite a bit of support to help navigate this world. And it probably wasn't a conscious decision at that point. I, I kind of then set out on this journey to just start gathering skills and experiences to help me along the way. But I don't think, uh, you know, if you would have asked me then, I would have said, oh, yes, I'm out to gather these 17 skills so that one day I can go and do something. It definitely was not that way. And in fact, there were periods of that time, as often happens to 18 and 19 year olds, where you lose your way and you're wrapped up in the college parties and the running up a bit of debt because you're living beyond your means and you're really worried about where are we spending spring break. And so while I was still interested in driving change and, and changing myself, it did fall by the wayside a bit because I was worried about when can we go to Cancun and drink a bit more. I don't think anyone could blame you for spending a bit of time worrying about when you were going to go to Cancun, personally. As an adult, do you think you've become more or less radical and what do you think has been behind that? I would say I've become more radical in some aspects in that my risk appetite in terms of personal risk or the things I'm willing to try has definitely increased. I think some of that's just because of age and experience and I, and I have a better mechanism to evaluate those risks before I take them. Some of that is you know, feeling more financially independent and sound today so that you know I, I can take some of those risks. But on the other hand, I think I've become a little bit risk averse. I was kind of on this rotation for years of every two to three years moving countries, you know, whether that was working for City or Barclays or some of the other places and, and getting lots of international exposure to lots of businesses, having now, you know, been in the UK for 13 years and really settled. So in that respect, I'm taking more risks, but there are risks here as opposed to uprooting myself and family and, and moving, you know, halfway across the world for some crazy job that I know nothing about. I think those days are behind me. Never say never, but I just don't see that that's probably going to happen anymore. That's really interesting. And several of our guests have actually said something similar. So far more radical in certain areas, but less so in others. So I want to come on to your little bit radical work now. The first question for our listeners, you had a long career in finance and banking, as you say, traveling all over the world, big brands, Citibank, Barclays. And then you had this kind of second phase, do I call it a second act of your career where you were really focused on financial well-being in the kind of in the third sector and the, the charity sector. So I'd like you to talk about those two acts, if you like, and what is the relationship between the financial industry or the banking industry and financial well-being? What led you on that journey? Yeah. And I think it's interesting that you've chosen the analogy of, of acts because uh, one of our founders also describes our strategy at Wagestream in terms of acts, you know, one, two, three. And I would very much say that I'm now in act three. So I'm, I'm glad you've, you've chosen that way. That works really well. Yeah, act one was very much gathering experiences, learning about cultures, the good and the bad of banks, you know, working through different situations. So, when, you know, I spent six, seven years in the US doing a whole bunch of different jobs in call centers and in operations and in technology, and but all centered around debt collection. And that was a time when the US was not a very nice place. If you were behind on your credit card more than a couple of months, you were going to get a whole bunch of phone calls, a whole bunch of letters and threatened and, and just wasn't nice. And people had zero empathy for your situation. And in fact, we were incentivized to start every conversation with how much can you pay today? 
that would be unfathomable today because today we think about, you know, you call a person, we try and understand their situation. How can we help them? You know, all of those different things that just would not have happened back then. And I thought that was normal, right? I thought, okay, well, yeah, this is the way it works. And then I went to Germany as my first international assignment, again, tied back to my previous experience. And it was 2003, the German economy was really, really bad. Unemployment was rampant. The, the German state was feeling the repercussions of this reunification thing, right? 1989, 1990, and all the money that that cost, and it was really starting to bite. And now trying to support a society of people who didn't pay into a system, but pay them their pensions and their benefits and all the things. The business was on its knees. And this was really a transformation assignment of going in and trying to figure out how do we build this debt collections function in, in Germany and realizing very quickly that this wasn't the same as collecting credit card debt in Kansas City. These were people who cannot pay, not that they didn't want to, they cannot, and they had real life issues and zero safety net to help them or an insufficient safety net and starting to learn through that. And then the same thing was repeated when I went to Russia three years later. And again, building a business, but also, you know, this is a group of people where the average age in the bank was 24, 25, because people working for a Western brand needed to speak English and people over the age of 40 didn't speak English because it wasn't taught. And helping those individuals navigate their own personal lives while giving them a job and, and helping our customers. And again, similar to that experience in Germany where there wasn't a handbook for this stuff. And actually then realizing that many of the people I was working with actually were only hoping to get out, right? You know, they had joined an international bank so that they could hopefully get a, a one-way ticket out of there someday and find a job in another country. And then it's always interesting when I think about this story now, because it's not unlike what's probably, and not, not what probably, but what is, and I still have Russian friends and many of them are sitting there having the same conversation today as, you know, how can I get out of this place and, and go somewhere else? Because they are, you know, the majority of people on the ground there are not happy with, with what's going on. But yeah, it's um, so, so that was all really transformational in terms of experience. And it doesn't have to be one way in terms of, oh, we're just a big bad bank and we want to get our money back. I then took a role within Barclay Card and I was the chief control officer for Europe. And that was kind of the first time I moved into, so out of the operational credit space and more into regulation. And that was when consumer credit regulation was coming in in the UK and the, the Financial Conduct Authority or FCA was founded 2014. Sitting there trying to have debates with very senior people in a bank around you know, how we treat customers. And again, the commercial motivation from their side of being, no, you know, if they don't pay or if they don't do this or if they don't do what we want them to, we're just going to jack their interest rate up to, you know, 30% and we don't care what happens to them. And trying to to transform that culture. So I always saw myself as now I'm, I'm sitting in this bank. I always felt different than the rest of the people around me. I always thought my job was to fight and be the customer advocate to bring the other view. Because, you know, while, yes, we were all motivated commercially in some respect, we wanted our bonuses, we wanted our pay, we wanted to keep our jobs. But there are different ways to to accomplish the same goal. So bringing some balance to those conversations. That was great, but it took its toll. Being the only guy in the room sometimes who was fighting on behalf of the customer is a difficult job. Many of your listeners will identify with that. And eventually I said, you know what, enough's enough. And, and in particular, Barclays was a special breed of people and culture. And I got the opportunity to take redundancy. And I said, yes, please pick me. I want to go. And so that closed Act 1. And I was sitting at home thinking of what does, well, now what we'll call Act 2, but what does that look like? And that led me really to a place of Let's go out and gather some more experiences, but let's look at the other side of the coin. So I became a trustee of a debt charity. I went and volunteered at Citizens Advice in a job center, giving debt advice and helping people adjust to what was then a pilot program called Universal Credit. And, and I happened to live in South London, and we were one of the pilot boroughs for Universal Credit. And so without knowing or thinking about it, I ended up actually at the beginning of this really big piece of change for our society here in the UK when it comes to the benefit system. And then doing lots of just random jobs, working at the food bank, doing your know, volunteering, those types of things, gathering those experiences from people that I would not have encountered in my daily life in the ivory towers of, of Canary Wharf or anywhere that I was before, and really th saw an opportunity there to marry my financial expertise, my commercial acumen, but also this other side of the world that exists 
and that led me down the path of financial well-being and and thinking about you know how can we help people help themselves before they get into any of these situations because we are a society of extremes so we have really great support services if you are wealthy they're called financial advisors we have pretty good support services if you're in really tough times and from you know needing debt advice and you know wanting to file bankruptcy or whatever it might be but the majority of people find themselves in the middle and for most of them they feel like they have nothing they have nowhere to turn they didn't get financial education in school they just kind of learn by doing learning on the job and often learning by making expensive mistakes absolutely and that brings us surely to Wage Stream, an act three of your career, where you're chief risk officer at Wage Stream. So tell us about Wage Stream, and I imagine that you're going to tell us about how it fits for those of us who find ourselves in the middle. So Wage Stream is very much my act three, but it began as part of act two, actually. So one of the jobs that I decided to take part time was working for a charity called the Money Charity, which was all about financial capability for people. So young kids all the way up through adults. And that was a really interesting role for a whole number of reasons. But that's actually where Wage Stream, they came knocking one day um, about four, just four and a bit years ago when they were founded. And I remember, you know, she's still a friend to this day, but the head of marketing coming and saying, you know, look, we've built this or thinking about building this app. We really need to learn about financial well-being and what that means. Can you help us? Yeah, sure. So went in back then. It was 10 people in the back of a WeWork and uh, we had a session on what is financial well-being and started talking about all of the different things that that encompasses and how could we take the theory of financial well-being or what was really talked about as financial capability in the UK at that point and embedding it into an app to get people to do things like budget better and be you know be be uh, better with their money and and all of those different things and over the period of about three three and a half years I kind of dipped in and out at WageStream, helping with various projects. Because at this point, I'm freelancing. I'm doing lots of different things, portfolio, career. And I was able to dip in and out. And every once in a while, they'd ring up and say, hey, let, can we talk about this? Can we work on this project? And we'd do that. So I never was very far from WageStream. Definitely wasn't you know, on the inside. There wasn't, you know, they were growing leaps and bounds, expanding into different territories until early 2022, so last year now. And they said, oh, can you come in and help us kind of recalibrate some of what we're doing financial well-being? Sure. And because it was after the pan, just after the pandemic, I was so happy to not work here in my home office that I used to go into their office and sit a couple of days a week just as a change of scenery. And I happened to overhear a conversation about wanting to go into credit and how they wanted to continue building the business. I started talking to them and we went from two days to three and we went from, you know, can you do this? Can you do that? And then a couple of months ago, the, the founders said, hey, you know, would you be interested in a, in a chief risk officer role? And on one hand, I thought, oh, no, I don't want to go back to full time work. I love the variety of the portfolio and the having Fridays off and not having to ask anybody if I want to have a day off and all of those kind of things. But but I think if, as a testament to what kind of company they are, they are one of the few, if not the only organization that I would be willing to go back into full-time employment for, which is what I did because of being purpose-driven. And it's, it's everything that I'm about, which is that, that kind of support for, in this case, low-income workers. But we could easily broaden that at some point in the future when you're kind of dealing with the the group where it's most acute at the moment, but really helping people who are in hospitality, leisure, who've had a rough go, right, for a couple of years because of the pandemic, and now we're having a rough go because of cost of living. It's just been relentless, in particular those groups of people, to just give them another way so that they're not turning to, you know, high cost, short term credit, which is actually how the organization started, which was kind of a, how can we get you away from high cost, short term credit or payday loans back then? Luckily, a lot of the payday loan industry has disappeared, but there are still plenty of bad players out there and giving people an alternative, but not just about streaming income, which is where it started and having you know access to their money a few days before payday. But much more than that, having access to, to ways to build savings habits, having access to financial coaches, which, you know, again, I, I mentioned financial advice. The next step down from that is, you know, is financial coaching, which people see as a slight bit more accessible because it's usually not as expensive. Still expensive if you're on £9.50 an hour, right? You know, paying a coach 100 or £120 an hour is still expensive for, for most people. And even some of the other providers that are out there that do a really good job, 
But at the end of the day, there's still a contribution to be made by the employee to that support. And even if that support is 10 pounds, again, for a person, you know, who's on nine pounds 50, that's more than an hour of work, maybe two hours after with tax. And so to have an app in your pocket where I can, you know, wake up at three o'clock in the morning and be worried about some money question and be able to punch that question in and have it answered in the, you know, very shortly personalized is really a big step forward. And it is really great support. And now introducing, you know, all kinds of other products, like helping people switch their broadband in the app, like helping people to access vouchers to reduce their supermarket spend. Really, really important now in the world of cost of living with food prices shooting up the way they are and just really becoming this financial well-being super app. So a long way away from just streaming income. And here's a few articles from the Money Advice Service that you might want to read. A lot of that is all still there. It's the core, but a much more holistic solution for financial well-being than, than ever was probably thought about at the beginning. And it sounds like you're building quite an exciting mix of kind of long-term education and uh, longer-term support yeah. with things like the getting a handle on the savings and stuff, as well as like in the moment, kind of I've got a real problem now supports you know access to to someone who may be able to give you some financial coaching then and there in the moment have i got that right yeah you definitely have that right and i and it's extremely important that people have both of those options and i think actually one of the things you know working for a charity that did financial capability and there's a lot of people around and you know, maybe some of your listeners are now this this could be controversial you might get a lot of comments and that may be not a bad thing for the podcast, but fingers crossed. There's a huge group of people out there who think that financial education in schools is a really great idea. I'm not one of those people. I used to be one of those people. I'm not one of those people for two reasons. The first thing is you need the ability to apply skills as you learn them. And for many kids, you know, if you're in year five and someone's there teaching you about what is a credit card, what are you going to do with that information? And it's even harder now because they don't even see their parents pull out the card anymore. They don't see their parents pull out cash anymore. They, these concepts where at least they saw it going across the till, it doesn't happen, right? It's online. It's on the phone. They don't understand that mom and dad are paying for things. Um, so it's become even harder for kids to understand how all of that works. And like a lot of things in life, you are not necessarily open to learning things when you don't need them. The first time many people learn about mortgages is when they're sitting across from their mortgage broker or they're on the phone with their mortgage broker. Now, you and I can both sit here and smile and nod and say it would be great if we taught them about mortgages five years earlier. But how much of that information would people actually retain? I think, again, controversial, but I think if you look at the numbers of the effectiveness of financial education in schools, or even financial education in other places, you know, university, wherever, it's probably not that effective. You have to work really hard to make the numbers tell the story you want if you're trying to justify your existence as a financial education provider in the charity sector. When in fact, you look at a person who moved into their first house, and so I'll give an example of something that comes through in our, you know, our coaching. We get lots of people who say, you know, I finally made it, I've moved out, I'm now paying rent, free from my parents or family or whomever. I have no clue about paying my bills, where to go to register for council tax. My broadband bill's too high, I need to switch. Those are all things a person can pick up the app today and ask us, and we can help them. And in some cases, we can say, here's a link, you can go to this switching tool and do it. And in some cases, it's signposting them somewhere else. But that's relevant, and that can change their life today that can you know they can ask us that question at 4 p.m get an answer at 402 and have changed their broadband provider by 4 30. that's exciting isn't it i think that has to be more powerful than sitting in a classroom and listening to somebody drone on about you know what, how to calculate the apr of a credit card that's a perfect example i think of the kind of little bit radical idea and the little bit radical thinking that we do love on this podcast because i think you were talking about like you say pretty strong consensus financial education is a good thing and then people think education oh school but what you're saying i think actually makes a huge amount of common sense that actually it's sort of far more relevant to have that education at the point where it's most relevant to that person just in time works in manufacturing it can also work in education right 
I, I don't know about your other listeners, but I'm an avid talk radio listener. And every day somebody's calling in with the solution to every problem, which is, oh, well, we'll teach it in schools, right? We either going to need to leave kids in school 365 days a year if we're going to get through all of this content. And the other thing is who's preparing these teachers to teach it? So, yeah, financial education is another perfect example of many of them themselves are 24, just out of teacher training and probably could use the training, right? But yet they get told you need to go and teach finance. And the other thing that happened when it was added to the curriculum, it is actually compulsory in the curriculum, but you know, you'd be surprised the number of schools that don't do it. One of the things that happened is all the funding dried up because all the private funders who used to fund it said, oh, well, now it's you know for the state to do. We're going to go and fund something else. We're not going to do that anymore. And and I believe that it actually set the whole financial capability movement back a number of years. Wow. That's quite a bombshell, Eric. And a good example of very well-intentioned people, but uh, perhaps not the right solution. Unintended consequences, they're usually what get us every time, right? Yeah, of course, of course. I want to go back on something that you said, actually, when you were first with the team at WageStream and they were coming to you asking, Eric, what is financial well-being? How would you sum up financial well-being to our listeners today? Have you boiled it down to a formula? Have I boiled it down to a formula? I cannot take credit for the formula because I think like everything, you can only skin the onion so many ways. And there's plenty of people that have come before me that tried to define financial well-being. So I tend to borrow my definition of financial well-being, and I borrow it from a person who people can look up uh, named Chris Budd. He's a former financial advisor, but now the, the founder of the Institute for Financial Well-Being. And he wrote a book a number of years ago called The Financial Well-Being Book. And, and actually, at the very beginning of my journey, I, I spent a lot of time with him, which was great. I think he defined it so well that I just had to say to him, there's no point in me trying to redevelop this. It's already good. And it really comes down to five points. And it's around having objectives or goals. Really, really important. You know, if, we, if you think about savings, why save money if you don't know what you're saving for? If you're saving for a house, you'll be pretty disciplined because you're trying to get your deposit together. If you're just putting money away to put money away, for most people, that's not going to, to be sustainable. It's about being in control of your daily finances. And this is where the world probably spends most of their money and time marketing to us because that feeling of control as humans is so important, whether it's in control of our finances or any other aspect of our life. And that's why you have people constantly trying to sell you budgeting apps and you know different types of accounts. And you know, now, unfortunately, everybody says, oh, buy our products, you know, take out this loan, it will help your financial well-being. Debt consolidations are a really good example of a tool that help people feel in control, at least temporarily. Great, I've consolidated my debt, I can make one payment. But I think we'll find if we dig around too much that most people who take out debt consolidation a few years later end up with double the amount of debt, right? Because we didn't fix and think about those behaviors that got us there in the first place. It's around being able to deal with financial shocks. And my, haven't we all had a lot of uh, training in financial shocks in the last three to four years between the pandemic and the cost of living? So I needn't explain that one to anybody. And then and it's about options. And that can be an option in terms of what product am I able to select? You know, Do I get the credit card with a 20% interest rate or a 45% interest rate? And if I have one of those higher rate ones, why is that? Is it because I'm new to the UK and all the banks hate people that are new to the UK for the first two years? They're just not very nice. Or is it because I had some credit event in my life? And then finally... And this is a, not a fun one, but again, pandemic, very important here in, in shaping our learning, is that clarity and security for the future. So what happens when you die? Who's going to get your money? How much do you need for them? Maybe you have a child that's you know disabled and you need to save for them for you know, to make sure that they're well taken care of after you're gone. We tend to think dying means I need to have a will. Well, there's a whole lot of other things to talk about when it comes to future planning, not just wills. So those five things together create financial well-being, I believe, and others w will believe. And then I think it's really about how do we find the right solutions for individuals because people are complex, finances are complex, and everybody's solution will be slightly different. There is no one size fits all. Money always comes up as the number one contentious issue, source of arguments, source of disagreements. I think it's often cited as the reason for divorce. Why is that? What is it about money? I think most of the research tells us two things. The first thing is we argue about it because we feel like we're on the back foot. 
And it's one of those areas of your life where we're all probably not educated enough in terms of what it should look like. So we're, you know, victims of our own experiences, positive or negative. We have expectations of other people when we enter a relationship, you know, that they must be like us. Because on your first date, you don't usually hand over a copy of your credit report, do you? I often joke that my other half works for a dating app and they haven't picked up my idea yet. But I often think, could we could we put, you know, credit score and you know debt levels and all those things in the dating app? Maybe that would... Uh, lead to, to better matches? I don't know. I guess not, because they haven't taken my idea. You had it here first. Yeah. <laughs> Invest on uh, Crowdcube. That's next right. Week, Eric. <laughs> if anybody wants to build that app, you know, I'll give you my number. Um, but I think it's that. So we, we feel like we're on the back foot. It also often requires us to admit that we've screwed up, right? That we're not good. Every one of us, whether you consider yourself to be good with money or bad, myself included, we can point to at least one point in our life where we probably made a really bad financial decision, whether that was getting into too much debt or overspending on shoes or whatever it was. We've all been there. There's shame and embarrassment attached to it. So again, so when we enter that conversation with someone, we're already, you know, heightened, you know, blood pressure is rising. Why is my spouse questioning why I spent two ninety five yesterday on this? And I think we're just, we also live in a society that tells us talking about money is taboo and talking about money is bad. And that's why we have this thing in the UK called Talk Money Week, which is usually the first or second week of November every year, because including in your job, often you're told, don't discuss your salary, don't discuss your bonus, don't discuss anything about your remuneration. And then it's not considered polite to go and brag to your friends about how much you make or how much you spent on your house or, or whatever, even though they know because they've all been on the building or the land registry to see how much you spent on your house. We wrap all this stuff up and make it secretive and that just doesn't help. Absolutely. I find that secrets are never really a good thing. In any, and you're right, actually, there is a real strong culture around not talking about it. And that is always going to lead to problems because the truth, while painful, I feel is very rarely a bad thing. You can always know what you're facing when you have the truth. Absolutely right. That's been a fascinating conversation about your work and, and about money. Thank you so much. So we're going to move on to the final section of our time today now, which is to lift you out of your financial services and financial well-being world and to ask you to look out to the world at large. And what little bit radical change would you like to see in the world that maybe you can't personally affect, but you would like to see and others to get on board with? I think for me, it will always stay on this kind of trajectory of finance, financial well-being, building th these skills. You know, we're making headway in the UK, lots of work to do, but there are still a lot of places on this planet that are where we were 50 years ago for whatever reason, whether it's, you know, the secrets like you just mentioned or um, you know, regimes that don't allow people to do what they need to do, know what they need to know. So I often think alongside of talking about making sure that people have food, making sure that people have shelter, you know, making sure that they have a safety net, right? you know, whether that's money or otherwise, we have to continue to build and make available education, but just in time education, and also adapt that to different cultures. And I think that's one of the things that the money world still hasn't done very well. If you look at money in the UK, as an example, there's a lot of white middle class people talking a lot about what we ought to be doing with our money. That doesn't work for all races. That doesn't work for all religions. That doesn't work for all communities. So there's a lot more left to do both here and, and elsewhere. And how do we adopt or adapt some of those concepts to be more accessible to other groups of people? We're coming to the end of our time together now, Eric, and we're going to end as we always end, which is that if there's someone listening today who has a little bit of a radical idea for their work or for their, for their personal life, perhaps something to do with their finances, what advice would you give them to get that off the ground? It's going to be a bit cliche, but I think there's a little bit of just do it, right? I think take the leap, take the jump really think about what's the worst that can happen. And I think in particular, and this is one of the things you appreciate when you come from a country like the US and you move to a country like the UK. In the US, I would have been much less likely to take some of the risks that I took because I have to worry about healthcare and safety nets and, you know, 
lack of a social system and all of that. We live in a place, and yes, it has its flaws and we can debate and whatever, but we live in a place where actually you are able to to take risks. And yeah, they might not pay off. If nothing else, you'll learn something. You may not make the money you want or get the customers you want or do something else, but we'll always be learning. And, you know, tomorrow will be okay. You know, it might be difficult, but you will survive. You'll get through it. And so be opportunistic. Look for those things and just say yes, right? I think there's a lot of power in, in saying yes and thinking about how you'll do it later. If you were, if you get bogged down in how am I going to make this work or how is this going to happen? Then you'll never do anything. Say yes and figure it out as you go along. Everyone else is blagging it as well. They just don't admit to it. Fantastic, Eric. Thank you. You've been a fantastic guest. Thank you so much for joining us today. Anyone listening, looking to improve the financial well-being of their employees definitely needs to check out WageStream. And thank you so much for taking the time to speak to us today. I hope to speak to you again very soon. Thank you for listening to this podcast. If you enjoyed it, please follow us on your podcast platform. If you'd like to appear on A Little Bit Radical or have an idea of someone we should speak to, please email podcast at standingongiants.com or get in touch with me on LinkedIn. You can search Rob Fawkes or search Standing on Giants and you'll find me there. Thank you very much and speak to you next time. (laughs) 